Ryder and Mount glided down the slope through stands of kinswood trees, larches, shiny-leaved beeches, and oaks festooned with dangling catkins. Silent and surprising, the pair appeared first in one beam of bright sunlight, then another, at a speed that would have startled any merely mortal eye. The rider's pale cloak seemed to catch and reflect the colors all around, so that an idle or distracted glance would have seen only a hint of movement, imagined only wind. The warmth of the day pleased Tanahaya. The music of forest insects pleased her too, the whirring of grasshoppers and the hum of busy honeymakers. Even though the smell of the mortal habitation was strong, and this patch of forest only a momentary refuge, she spoke silent words of gratitude for an interlude of happiness. Praises, mother son, praises for the growing scents, praise for the bees and their golden dance. She was young by the standards of her people, with only a few centuries upon the broad earth. Tanahaya of Shiseron had spent many of those years in the saddle. First as messenger for her clan's leader, Himano of the Flowering Hills. Then later, after she had made her worth known to the House of Year Dancing, performing tasks for her friends in that clan. But this errand to the mortal's capital seemed as if it might be the most perilous of all her journeys, and was certainly the strangest. She hoped she was strong and clever enough to fulfill the trust of those who had sent her. Tanahaya had been described as wise beyond her years, but she still could not understand the importance her friends placed on the affairs of mortals, especially the short-lived creatures who inhabited this particular part of the world. That was even more inexplicable now, when it seemed clear to her that the Zedaya could no longer trust any mortals at all. Still, there was the castle she had been seeking, its highest roofs just visible through the trees. Looking at its squat towers and heavy stone walls, it was hard for Tanahaya to believe that Aswa, the greatest and most beautiful city of her people, had once stood here. Could anything of their old home be left in this pile of clumsy stone that men called the Hayholt? I must not think of what might be true, of what I fear, or what I hope. Horse and rider moved down the slope. I must see only what is. Otherwise I fail my oath, and I fail my friends. She stopped at the edge of the trees. Tsa, spider silk, she whispered, and the horse stood in silence as Tanahaya listened. New noises wafted up the slope to her, as well as a new and not entirely welcome scent, the animal tang of unwashed mortals. Tanahaya clicked her tongue and Spider Silk stepped aside into shadow. She had a hand on the hilt of her sword when a golden-haired girl dashed into the sunlight, a basket of winter flowers swinging in one hand, daffodils and snowdrops and royal purple crocuses. Tanahaya's senses told her the child was not alone, so she stayed hidden in the shadows between trees as a half-dozen armed soldiers followed the child in gasping, clanking pursuit. After a moment, Tanahaya relaxed. It was clear the mortals did not mean to harm the little one. Still, she was surprised that mortal soldiers were so heedless of danger. She could have put arrows in most of them before they even realized they were not alone in the kinswood.